festival co-director, Ujjan being a colleague of ours, and much of uh, all of the designs that you see across the festival has been created by him. And he's actually designed the wonderful uh, illustrations in this book. So perhaps we can start by first unveiling uh, yes. the book, Namita. So. so my granddaughter, Anina, is welcome up here. Anina, come up and you will help us uh, and let's stand. So, Anina, we just have to unwrap. Anina, come next come to Come here, next to Nani. Me. And open the book and you have to take it out. You have to be the first to take it out. Lovely. Thank you, Anina. Thank Do you want to say something about Nani? We're quite happy for you too. Nani been troubling you today? Okay. Okay. So when I sat, sat down, I think it was just post uh, New Year's. Namita, when the book came out, uh, I'd seen some of the illustrations that Ujjan had done. I hadn't read the book and then I sat down post New Year's when I came back. And uh, I wasn't entirely sure what to expect because it was yet another tale of the Mahabharata. But it was such an easy and wonderful read, full of revealing facts. And the fact that it's a book that appeals to both young and old alike. And I would really uh, entreat you all uh, to pick up a book uh, at the end and get Namita to sign it. So Namita, let me start with you. The Mahabharat, countless tales. How have you found a new way to tell this particularly ancient tale, which has been told so many times? Um, you know, about 10 years ago, I was asked to write the Mahabharat for young readers, the Puffin Mahabharat for young readers, which became something of a classic, goes on selling, children keep reading it, they grow up, they make their children read it almost. And in all those stories, there was one story that moved me to the core which was a story of the firstborn son of the Pandavas. And because he was from the Rakshas race, he was half Rakshas, and he never got the due of being the most courageous, the most dutiful, the most loyal of all the Pandavas' sons. So I, I, it hurt me the same way it hurt me to hear the story of Surpanakha, the way so many stories in the, uh, the story of Karan, there are so many stories in the Mahabharata of courage and valor, but they are also stories of what at that time was a very hierarchical society and uh, which was not always fair to everybody in it, as no society ever is. So I just knew I had to write the story. Ten years ago, I told Ravi Singh, I am going to write a story about a small boy who goes to Sata Lake and gets lost. And 10 years later, that's the story that came out. Lost I'm going to time. come back to the story of the small boy. But Ujjan, you know, the minute you, you, you read about a Rakshas, you think of somebody who is huge and, and evil looking and has got red eyes and this huge moustache. And your, yet your, um, your drawing of Ghatot Kach is actually, he's handsome, he's got gentle, caring, lovely eyes. So how did you sort of uh, uh, bring that out in terms of the graphic and the drawing of it? Um, so I think it was interesting because the first time Namita came and told me the story, um, I think it was in May or June, and she told me the story in such a way that it resonated in me very personally not just as someone who'd enjoy the content for what it was, um, something that's filled with like magic and fantasy and stuff like that, but also like as a boy, when I see myself as the character in this book, who's a boy who gets lost in time, who ends up in a place where he doesn't know what it, what is what, he makes an unlikely friend, and he enjoys normal boy stuff. I mean, he enjoys playing football and he enjoys spending time with his friends and he enjoys going on these adventures. So, in a sense, it was really the content that was so powerful for the character for me to actually come up and we spoke about how we would, you know, portray Ghatotkach and his relationship with the boy and 
um, we finally ended up deciding that it would be best if he, he were a friendly giant, as it were. So that's, I think, what we were going for. In fact, for those of you who pick up the cover, you may see, and I don't know, Namita, whether you realize, some of the face and certainly the eyes and the empathy is actually Ujjan. And yes. to me, and to me, immediately, I was like, wow, he's painted himself ah. kind of stuff. So. Uh, Ujjan, apart from everything, is also an artist, and some of his work hangs on my walls at home, and he's... I mean, your particular form that you've developed, Ujjan, so when did you and how did you develop that? Um, so I actually worked on this for Can we also show years. some of the, uh, can we show some of the, uh, the images as well, please? The clip, you can the, put it into a loop. Yeah. So I essentially tried to hone a certain kind of, s a sense of a style at least for several years and um, it ended up being so, unique that I sort of ran with it but what happens generally is is that it's very easy to get complacent when you find something that you're really good at when you see you found your style and you're like okay fine achha, I'll just do that and nothing else so this was an interesting break really for me as well because um, of course Namita had her own views and she was very like relaxed with the way things wanted to happen but um, we had a great team with uh, at Penguin also, and uh, they really knew what they wanted to show and portray and the way things should look. And I think that, adjusting to that itself was interesting for me as well, to come up with one unique style but keep it very particular to, to what was in the story. So if I can interrupt here, uh, we discussed a lot what Ghatot might look like. And uh, Ghatot Kach was supposed to be bald. Uh, that's why he was called head like a jug with these big ears. And I looked up and researched and showed him images. And the first Gatot Kutch was looking wonderful, but like an alien. So I told him, let's put the top knot up, like that uh, Judah style. And then he Shibji worked on it. So we really detailed a lot of things together, sometimes uh, quite late in the evening when he got over from your taxing times in <laughs> teamwork. He would ring me up and say, but what will he be wearing? Because he was in swimming trunks when he was lost in time. And we said that watch. So there was so much detailing between the team at Penguin, between Ujan and me, that I think doing these illustrations was the most fun part of the book. Going back to the book, Namita, it's actually a love story. It's a love story between Hidimba and the Pandav. It's a love story about uh, the boy who gets lost in time uh, with the gentle giant. And it's a love story of also Hidimbi with um, her son and with this boy who she discovers from another race, from another thing. So much of your romantic uh, uh, self has sort of come out in many different ways and in, in different layers. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? You know, it's interesting. I never thought of this as a love story, but you're the second person to ask a question rather like this. And you weren't there at the first uh, time okay. this question was asked. So. Well, there's a certain bromance between uh, Ghatot Kach, the big, huge, lovely, giant Ghatot Kach, and tiny Chintu Pintu, who all he likes, all he wants to do is be tall, and he wants to be a footballer, and he wants to be brave. So it's this story between the two. But the love story of Hidimbi, her loyalty to this man who left her, when she was pregnant and who she never saw again, but she raised the son in memory of him, Bhim. So that moved me very deeply. So there's, there's a little bit of a childhood romance also with a young lady called Karuna. And what surprised me the most in all this was that all these love stories come through the point of view of a 13-year-old boy. And here I am, when I was 26, I wrote a grown-up book and here at 62, I'm writing in the voice of a 14-year-old. And that 14-year-old's, 13-year-old's perception of all the different sorts of love that he sees. He sees the disrupted and broken marriage of his parents, and he despairs about their love. So it, it is many, many in love fact, stories. In fact, one of the most empathetic uh, parts in the book was that when um, Ghatot Kaj goes to his mother after they've met his father in the jungle, and his mother says, so did he ask after me? And Ghatot Kach lies and says that he sends you all the love. Uh, 
it has such a poignant and beautiful moment. And again, I'm going back to the whole thing of love and love of a mother. But in this case, it was the love of the son and the, uh, the desire not to hurt his mother because he realized that she was still in love with his father. So tell us a little bit about that, both in terms of the research and in the Mahabharata, because the way we look at the Mahabharata is really about the big wars and the millions of elephants and, you know, uh, uh, Krishna and all of that. So tell us a little bit about this, the poignant aspect of it. The Mahabharata has a million, it is stories within stories within stories. And it has, uh, so I can confidently say it has a million, but it has certainly a few hundred love stories within it of very joyous ones, sad ones, the love of uh, Draupadi. She has five husbands, but the husband she loved the most was Arjun. Arjun was the one she had chosen. And the very different sorts of love Draupadi had for her five husbands, which shows through even in this book. And uh, Bhim was the only one who really loved Draupadi and protected her in any situation. So there's a little story here where Bhim goes and collects the flowers, the Brahma uh, pool from uh, Kuber's garden for Draupadi. And uh, the other wife, uh, uh, Hidimbi, Hidimbi's son takes some of those flowers to his mother and says, he sent them for you. So the, the stories I've got here are actually, if they are not from the direct stories of the Mahabharat, they are other stories of the Mahabharat, which have been aggregated, turned around. Because I, as almost everybody in the audience will know, the Mahabharat is the greatest story ever told in India. It's an epic that goes on and on being retold. There have been some very fine books about Bhim, but Ghatotka Chantol is there a lot in Dalit poetry. And uh, maybe some comic strips. So all of them find their new stories. Ujjan, there's one point that you've underlined in the book. In fact, um, when, uh, when, when this little boy, when when Ghatotkaj takes this little boy to introduce him uh, to his mother, Hidimbi. Uh, Hidimbi is sitting over her cauldron and, you know, cooking up uh, human beings and bits of bone and so on and so forth. And Ujjan has actually done this lovely drawing <laughs> of the cauldron. And I was wanting to ask him, are those bones and bits of human people sort of floating around? No, no, she had clarified. They should be. She clarified I mean, that I'm yeah. not feeding that to you, but I wanted to know whether that was in the, in even, the cauldron. Even if they aren't, they should be. They should be. Of course, yeah. No, Do rakshasas no necessarily eat human people? She says in the story somewhere yeah. that rakshas, yeah, of course. Of course. The, the whole story begins with her brother, Hidimba, deciding to eat Bhim. And she sees him, Hidimba, sees Bhim and falls in love with him. So she kills her brother so that she can save Bhim. So she saves his life. But he was meant to be dinner for. And so, so the, uh, there were, uh, uh, what I haven't told the audience is that um, this area in Kumau is actually the place where Hidimba was supposed to have lived. And there is a temple to her there. And there were cannibalistic tribes around. And uh, clearly, there was a strong tradition of cannibalism. And the uh, Rakshas, too, certainly had all kinds of things. But she's made it sure that since she's been married to a uh, Rajput, to a Thakur, to a great Kshatriya, the greatest Kshatriya of them all, she has stopped eating human beings. But tell me, Namita, in terms of, again, just historical research, when you look at the Mahabharat and you look at, you know, the Rakshas uh, 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 group of people, were they completely different? How were they portrayed? Were they completely different? Were, are they Rakshasas because they were big and strong and had other powers or were they sort of out of this world? See, I think um, the first differentiation in the Mahabharat is between the mortals and the immortals. And the immortals are supposed to have come from the uh, great bear, from the Saptarishi, and then there were the mortals with special powers. So the Pandavas were actually half mortals because they were birthed of the gods. And uh, the Rakshasas were actually the other in every form. And there's untold cruelty, both from the Rakshasas who would eat humans and demand one human a day and then be beaten up by one of the heroes of the Mahabharat. Or there would be noble Rakshasas like uh, Ravan, who in fact was the son-in-law of Jodhpur 
from uh, Rajasthan itself. I think we're going to start a riot again, so maybe no. we can go down that particular route right now. <laughs> he was a Brahma Rakshish. That means he was a Brahman who was a Rakshish. So somewhere it led to huge powers, but in the mountains and all, sometimes it just meant a giant race. But there were other races I have never been able to understand what they were. They were the Nagas. And it's not clear because these Naga maidens were so beautiful and the Naga men were so, there were the Gandharvs who were ethereal beings. So the, somebody I'm sure has done, but I've not read, the many classifications of the- uh, No, of all the of different all the people. Of all the different be beings, etc. You know, in, in, in life and of course in Bollywood, um, every film and every book has to have a baddie. But in your book, there's no baddie. Who's the baddie in this? I don't believe in baddies. <laughs> when you were again drawing uh, this book, given that you had all of this information for the Mahabharata, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Ujjan's, much of his art is actually based on the mythology of the Mahabharata. How different was this for you to sort of uh, design? Because the big manthan that I have hanging on my wall is your Rakshas and all their, uh, uh, all their beauty uh, against the gods, uh, in a sense. So how was it, Isn't how different was it? Exactly, I think it was really different. Put it on but um, it was also a really interesting experience because Just keep it you get to play with so many different kinds of aspects in the world building process, per se, because you're dealing with a very real a uh, boy who's growing up in Gurgaon, in next to Delhi, and suddenly you're in, you're transported to a world which has, you know, giant spiders and dragons and all sorts of strange and unique kind of creatures. So, in a sense, it was a, um, it wasn't so much uh, challenging, challenging as it was adapting to again saying a style which we sort of discussed a fair amount and then we knew that the boy would have to interact with Rakshas and be flying on Ghatot Kach's back and with him and going to various places. So, I mean, that in itself was very, very endearing to sort of get into and try and figure out all the unique things that they would do together. If you remember, one of our biggest problem was the proportion size. Yes. How, would, how big would Ghatot Kach be? in proportion to uh, our hero, Chintamani, Chintu Pintu. And we figured it out. We, he could have been bigger, but then we, my Yeah, I think you initially we, we thought that he'd also um, sort of managed to change his size at will. Yes. And sort of... We, because Ghatotkach could, could change his change. size. Yeah. But then if he changed his size in the illustrations, the readers would get very confused. One of the lovely uh, bits in terms of, uh, you know, when the boy is missing home and Ghatotkach sort of intuitively realizes that he's missing home and wants to do something for the familiar and he knows that the boy loves football and there's a dream that he's able to interpret and he brings Ghatotkach a football. So what was the football? I don't know whether the illustration of that football is coming up but maybe uh, uh, you can tell them a little bit about the football and how you, how you decided what it was. So the football scene again like a lot of um the adventures in the book wasn't, let's say, weren't what they would seem normally, obviously in this make-believe world. But uh, so what we finally decided was a ball of snakes, which would just be sort of coiled together, and they sort of it was almost like if you started with a rubber band on a ping pong ball, and then expanded that with like twenty thousand other rubber bands, and that's what it finally became. It was Be because a giant in the ball story somewhere. Snakes. You know, what happens is that uh, Ghatot Kach starts playing football just to make him feel at ease. But he makes this football with these entertained snakes. And it, Chintu Pintu is scared to play football like that, but he sort of tries, but he doesn't try too hard. And he, I think Ujan's interpretation of that magical football is so beautiful, it's almost mystical. It, it'll be somewhere there. You know, one of the most fascinating things in the book is actually the way that you have interpreted time travel. And I think time and space travel and spatiality, and I don't know whether any of you were in the session just now uh, on particle physics and dark matter. Did anybody go to that session? Absolutely fascinating in terms of the way it was described. But Namita, that's obviously every, I think every person's dream as to how you travel into this 
the way that you've done it in this wonderfully simple way, what came to you and how did you crack that particular thing? Because you're able to traverse between today's India, or, or like he said, uh, Gurgaon with these skyscrapers that he has in part two, uh, to this other world, which is 5,000 years ago. And you did it in the most wonderful way. So before we come back to what happened in the beginning, I want you to just tell us a little bit about your fascination See, with time travel. First of all, I want to ask how many people in the audience have seen the Mahabharat, the famous Mahabharat on television? You mean Mahabharat? <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. And how does it begin? Main kaal hoon. Main samay hoon. How does it, what does the line say? Main sam. So it began with that basic thing, main samay hoon. And this is a story that has been told and retold and retold and retold literally even historically for four, five thousand years. And each generation has reinterpreted it. And I thought some of the children, they love fantasy books from the rest of the world, but Indian myth sometimes has a forced element to it. It's not fun. It's what your mother tells you you must read. So I wanted to break out of that. Story. But your concept of time travel, like I, I said, I again, you've cracked it in so many different See, ways. See, I'm quite certain that time is elastic, that time is plastic, that time has holes in it. And there was a beautiful book by Carl Sagan called Contact. And Contact was a book, a novel about time travel. So really a lot of the time travel bit of it came from my rereading of one of my favorite books, Contact, where he goes back in time and you find that so much of it is in the mind and for the rest of it who want to know about time, Samay and Carl, please read the book. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I read up quite a lot of physics and time theory and time warps and Carl Chakra and put it together into a Rakshish stew of time. I think there are also some interesting bits in the story where um, it's Namita's added this like very nice kind of uh, humane sort of twist to the kind of things that um, Chintamani as a boy really misses. So there are instances where he really craves for pizza and then he wishes he had a mobile phone. So those are things that again, if you see, if you juxtapose that with his, um, his sort of growing up years in Delhi and where he is now in this place is interesting to see because how the what use is of today yes. is what is familiar and what isn't familiar in that sort of space. But I was fascinated by the idea of Rakshish technology, what we might have called magic because Rakshish technology had its own uh, theory behind it, which was that it was illusion based. And um, those of you who remember the Mahabharata and Ghatotkach's death, he used all his great Mayavi powers in the end to defeat uh, Karn in battle. And uh, the sad part is Ghatotkach died to the Shakti which Karn unleashed on him. And the reason why this was done partly was that Krishna in his manipulative way was it's very safe. happy it says Krishna smiled because Arjun was now safe. So it's how the marginalized. Favorites. It's about favorites as well. I it's about favorites and those who belong to the top of our society and those who don't. Marginalized. I'm going to come back to time travel again. You know, one of the, again, the way you sort of went between two places, did you make time stop in present day here while time was elastic in the other world? Because when he comes back, there's no real... Uh, eclipse in the amount of time that's that's moved yeah. forward. But that's what I read about time travel. That if you travel back in time and you come back, that's what would happen. You would come so back. So there's no jet lag. It's not that you're losing time or gaining no, time. No, it's it's no. just an elastic. Yes. Uh, through the thing. If you go through a wormhole. Wormhole. Uh, uh, so, anyway, yeah. Um, Ujjwal, again, you know, when they go to meet this wonderful sage uh, on the top of a mountain and they make this great trek to get to her. Again, you've created um, an image, uh, and I don't know again whether this is part of your, um, uh, your display. You've created this image of great peace uh, in a very small drawing with a crow, with a raven. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the raven. So the ravens um, had varied significance to the time travel process, and um, in a lot of Hindu mythology, there are um, certain vahanas which are associated yes. with characters and 
we really wanted to capture this sort of smoky, sort of almost um, ethereal kind of zone where there was just this woman sort of meditating and how they finally end up meeting this character um, would be this very sort of mysterious, almost ambiguous kind of person who they couldn't fully understand until they realized that this was Chintamani's only chance to get back. And they, yeah. they, they just really needed to understand what so was happening. That, there. in fact, was one of the great Mahavidyas of Hindu philosophical rahasya, and that is Dhumavati, Dhumavati, who is a goddess very few people know about. She is the old goddess with two black Himalayan crows as her uh, vahans. And she is the one, in my imagination, who guided it back. But I think Ujan's drawing of Dhumavati and the ravens is so, so, so beautiful. He, he gets both her, her raw strength and the little calm inside. Going back to, again, some of the most poignant moments in the book, and like I said, she may have written it for uh, young people, yeah. but it makes so much of sense for anybody who's a parent, anybody who has empathy. And the very fact that through the book, Namita, I think, at least readers who are familiar with the, uh, with the, with the myths of the Mahabharata know that Ghatotkach is going to be killed. Yes. And everything that Hidimbi refers to and everything he himself refers to, he always knows that this will happen in a sense. So this has to happen. Will you tell us a little bit about, about that, about mythology, about Indian philosophy? that allows you to do that in your own interpretation of how through the book you come back to allowing people to know, gently guiding them to the fact that this too shall end, but yet nothing ever ends and it continues. Well, you put it better than me. <laughs> but it's, you know, the, the thing is that the Mahabharat is about time, uh, the three phases of time, sometimes the fourth phase of time. and. Uh, it is said in the Mahabharata that time leaves nothing true. It is really a story about time. And the sense of, not of doom, but the sense of fate uh, that we know that uh, Chintamani knows when he comes back, he starts researching and he realizes how sadly he met his death and how bravely he met his death. And he goes into a deep depression after that. And then just to reassure him, because what I read or what I imagined, it's easier to travel back in time than to travel forward. So Ghatotkach makes that effort to come forward in time only to reassure Chintamani that nothing ever dies. Because I think young children at 10, 11, they have a deep fear of death which they don't dare express often, but it's there. And uh, they think about death a lot more than older people imagine they do. Uh, so this is where he comes to teach him but about this, the circularity of it. But is this one of the great lessons or stories in our uh, epics about death and about the fact that nothing, in a sense, ever actually ends? Nothing ends. Somebody, uh, Amba, Ambika, Ambalika, and then she comes back as the uh, Shikandi. So everywhere, it's, it's, if you believe in rebirth, then I guess everything does turn back. And so do you believe I, of in... Of course, I be, I'm a devout Hindu. I believe in everything, almost, not everything. So mostly we'll be saved in spite of everything that she said. So, do you believe in, in, in rebirth? Um, at some level, yes. And of course, there is that idea of, you know, where is heaven, what is heaven? Our perception of a heaven, if at all it is a heaven, is so unique to us as individuals and is so unique to each person for themselves. So it really is interesting when you make that parallel and we wanted to sort of show that, you know, that sort of nothing ever dies kind of um, sort of communication that they almost have with each other, which is through, well, we finally ended up using the one where, where he's in a reflection in a window pane. But there are other instances where Chintamani is taking care of his friend, this young girl, and he does communicate with Ghatotkach, and he always stays within him. And even till the end of the book where he's playing this football match, he's, he's there, you know, with him. So there is that sort of 
Sonja, uh, you know, we open up to audience. No, uh, Ujjan, you you know, much of your work uh, has had this influence of the great epic. So, what has influenced you to be able to do that, and what's your sort of relationship with the great epics that you every bit of your work, in a sense, is representative of it? I think for me, it was more so a lack of knowledge about Indian epics as such because you know growing up in in Delhi one and you know just going to an ordinary school you, you don't really read about these things as such you just read very sort of abridged versions of the Ramayana and Mahabharata and there is so much more that one can take away especially when you aspire to want to have to do something which is full of fantasy and you want to really sort of delve into the make-believe of it and I think that's what sort of kicked me off into want, sort of wanting to know more about what where is, what would these characters actually be like and in some of my work I've, I've tried to actually, you know, if there is uh, much like what we were discussing earlier with these crows, these vahans uh, are companions to sort of gods as they were to actually show them as characters themselves so if, you know, there was this painting which I had done, which was a painting of Kama, so, and he has this giant parrot. So to actually make the parrot in that scale, for him to interact with the parrot, and it's almost as, as if they are, you know, one, but they're two separate entities. So that wanting to know more, I think, is so important for everybody today, because these things are really sort of timeless as they were. And it's just so interesting to have to want to sort of try and make something out of it yourself to have your own interpretation is just so rewarding when you when you sort of get you know a, a story like this which you which has which is full of these things and it has time travel and it has these this great relationship with this boy so yeah that was and one excellent. of the things i found first of all it was so reassuring for me because i was writing as a young boy and i didn't know if it was coming right and when he's not quite such a young boy. Maybe at heart he is. <laughs> at heart he is. So when he read it, I asked him eagerly, did it sound all right? And he said, yeah, and that reassured me. And then I think when he interpreted it, because our young readers are very, very good readers, but their attention span sometimes need a little visual cue. So I think what Ujan has done for the book is to break it into these segments so that it's read with, with deep, deeper attention than if it had been a long text. Namita, you've always been extremely inclusive and, you know, all our conversations about bringing in different kinds of writing, etc. Were you politically correct in the book by naming him Chintamani? So there's this person from perhaps from the south uh, in contrast with all of these stories from the north. I mean, was that by accident? Was that by purpose? And, and similarly, you know, instead of doing cricket, which is, you know, obviously the whatever, you've got football, which is more like Ujjan's sport than so, it is the <laughs> national narrative of the time. I'm going to tell you two separate stories. If I forget the second story, remind me it's about football. Football. And I've already Please everybody, football. And the first story I've already forgotten, but let me tell you how Chintu Pintu came to be. That one, I have uh, my little granddaughter who came to um, unwrap the book. Who's now left for her pizza, I suspect. <laughs> so, uh, I got to watch a lot of films and read a lot of books as she was growing up. And once we were watching a TV serial which had a lot of black crows, by the way, in it, and it had a little boy called Chintu Pintu, who these crows troubled a lot. And she found this so funny. She'd say, put on Chintu Pintu, then she'd start rolling in the floor. What kind of name is Chintu Pintu? So then I decided, okay, this kid was going to be called Chintu Pintu. Having called him Chintu Pintu, I had to then make it. Chintamani, because Chintu Pintu, what else could he be? So he's Chintamani Dev Gupta, he could be. So it was an accident. No, it, it, it was synergy and meant to be. Was, and football? And football. So then, you know, when he comes back to Gurgaon, it, it was a bit dull, nothing much was happening. My editor, who I can see in the last row somewhere, the lovely Shohini Mitra, she said, Namita, the first half is working, second half needs something. So I said, what does it mean? What does it mean? I said, football. Now the thing is, I know nothing but nothing about football. I know about the same about cricket, but I said That's football. roughly the reason why she has the, uh, uh, him playing football with snakes, but hey, forget <laughs> that one. And so I 
did a lot of Googling. I got my little, not my little, my 17-year-old nephew to, we wrote out these exciting football scenes, you know. And uh, I was very happy with them. And then the other editor there, she very politely, she said, I don't think you got it right. She said, I don't know what to do. So like with Amitabh Bachchan, you phone a friend. I rang up Novi Kapadia. Now, for those of you who don't know, Novi Kapadia is India's greatest expert on football. And he was in the middle of some World Cup FIFA thing in Dubai. And I rang him up and I sent him messages. He said, yeah, I'll read it. Then he read it. Then he said, I'll rewrite it. So the wonderful last chapter has the exclamation marks and all from me and the exciting words, but the absolutely accurate picture of football is from my dear friend Novi Kapadia. And I have to tell you, I've become such a pro football person. By pro, I mean for football, not like a professional pro football. That we've got our, every year we end up having one cricket session. Shashi Tharoor will speak, Rajdeep Sardesai will speak. Somebody will speak and give us all their wisdom on cricket. This year we have the spirit of the game cricket versus football. So football has come to the Jaipur Lit Fest. Ujjan, I should actually ask this of your mother because she would perhaps have a better, and she's in the, in the first row and she's a wonderful designer and a professor and a teacher of design and, and art. And, You'll see some of her work across the venues, lovely peacock designs in the book signing stalls. The one here is missing for one reason. But uh, when did you start actually being fascinated with, uh, with drawing and painting? Do you have any memory? Did he, did he used to do squigglies? I think, yeah, I think it was, it just came to be naturally and I didn't really want to make it into something which would um, really be something which would stress me out. And thankfully, my parents weren't really pushing me into anything sort of like, oh, you must practice, hone the skill, do this. And they were sort of very chilled out with it. So for me, it was kind of an easy going way into sort of doing my own thing, drawing. And then it was just, it was just great because I would just keep it as a hobby because I knew that if I wanted to do it professionally and do it all the time, I might just get bored of it. and. You, you tend to lose out some of the essence of what you want to start and achieve with something like that. So it's, it's good, it's there as a hobby and it's always something that I can turn back to and say, hey, this is fun for me, I can just do that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I must confess that uh, some years ago, uh, Archan, uh, maybe somewhere here, the head of design and Ujjan came to me, there he's at the back. And both of them came to me and we used to outsource our design for the festival because of the volume of what needs to be done. Hundreds of signages, the books, the, ma the brochures, the, 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 the programming, every bit of uh, information that goes out. And we used to give it out to an agency and one day both of them came to me and said, why can't we do it? So I said, no reason, but do you think in all of the pressure of everything that you do, this is something that you're going to do. So I'm going to leave Ghatot uh, Kach for a second and go to uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, mnemonics that you use. How do they come into your head? The guy with the moustache. Yeah, the guy with the moustache is the, it's become the festival. Mascot. He's in London, Mascot. he's in Boulder, he's in Australia. The, uh, the, this year's typewriter, for example, with everybody crawling out of it or being typed out of it. So I think the... Uh the visual identity for most of it started, like Sonja said, several years ago when we got into this intense process of planning and what we should do, colors, themes, and we ended up narrowing it down to something which we were actually very concerned that not a lot of people would really sort of take to, which to, of course, um, our not so surprised it was what happened. I mean. Um, there were, we did find that there were, there were several hurdles with having to convince people to sort of go ahead with something which was illustrative and try and make it look so unique to a festival which is so global, um, which was a bit challenging. But thankfully, these guys over here were also were, took to it really well, and and I think it's just worked out on the whole really well, having to try and create this, it's not just creating these characters, it's creating this experience for everybody to enjoy and it's, it's something that, you know, it relates with everybody and 
you suddenly see these characters popping out of things and you're like, oh yeah, that's so ridiculous and bizarre, but I want to go there. I want to be there. I just want to, before I open it up, I want to ask Namita one, one last question and go back to the beginning of the book, you know, which, uh, which, is, which is set in, it's set in Satal, a place of your uh, origins. Tell us a little bit about the influence of Satal. Well, the strangest thing is that my last novel, Things to Leave Behind, was set in exactly the same geography, those same lake district of Nainital. So it's all the very same place and the very same thing. And uh, I know that geography in my dreams, in my mind, in my heart. I, I know every inch of it. And if it changes, I don't believe in those changes. I know it the way I know it, all across Kumau. So that's where it is. Lovely. Atul, how long do we have? No time now. How long do we have for questions? Do we have time? Or? Yes. So any questions? Right in front, Vani. We've got. So let's start from here. That is brilliant. And uh, and then we'll move to that side. Imagine how long wait to ask this question. Thank you for being fascinated with Chudels and Rakshasa. Rakshasa, <laughs> you know they are both very part of your narrative and your work. Yes. And thank you for such a beautiful session. Two questions, one you've already answered because the last seven pages of the book and I read the book while it was still in print. So I was fascinated by the way, you know, Gatok Kach has become, you know, this kind of a compassionate and such a kind, you know, character. So the second thing you've answered about the last seven pages because they are so dramatic and they are so contemporary. And I think a lot of children who may not be playing football will still, you know, hey, enjoy why it. Children, really, you know? I love getting to the end of the book ah, also. So. Just to get to the end of the book. <laughs> but Namita, you... No, I did feel cheated. I thought you could have stretched the story a little bit more. But you've actually created a parallel narrative of the Dada Dadi and the Nana Nani ki kahani. And while I'm saying this, you know, everybody was a Dhanav and a Dev. That was the negative and the positive. And here it absolutely reverses itself. So do you think when we are looking at literature, not just for children, but also for young people, this counter narrative and this balancing of understanding mythology, Sir. our, uh, you know, Ramayana and the Mahabharat stories have to be retold and narrated in a way that, you know, young people can today identify with it and understand it better? I think that is a very intelligent question and a very accurate question. Because when I take the Mahabharat to schools across India and I talk to the young children, uh, I ask them this question always. I say, you know, those were different times, things were different. Are there some people in the Mahabharat you think were treated unfairly? And they always reply, first of all, Karn. The maximum amount of sympathy for young people is for Karn, because they think he had a bad time. Then you have Eklavya. Uh, I in the, uh, I've always felt that Sita, I've worked on Sita a lot, and the Sita narrative needs to be retold. And uh, people like Surpanakha, I mean, it, it was not a very nice thing, though people in today's times also seem to think that it's very acceptable to cut off somebody's nose, we know, whose nose everybody wants to cut off. Because, and I found even in medieval times in Europe, it was a practice to cut off people's noses. So, a lot of these stories have to be retold just without distorting them, without uh, sanitizing them but just explaining to young readers and to older readers that there are many ways of reading them. So I think that's it. Barbaric, yes. I think the, the lady is with the... Is that the question? I, I want to say that it's a minefield. Indian mythology with the Mahabharata Ramayana. Yeah. And as you said, there are many characters. So what is been, the question? My question is, since you have started this thing, do you also think that in future you will take other characters also like this for the young people to write a book? I hope so. I certainly Thank hope you. so. I'm Thank going you. to keep writing for young children. Hi, Namita and Sanjay. I want to know that I come from Himachal Pradesh, and in Manali there is a yes, beautiful Hidimba. old temple dedicated Hidimba. to Hidimba Devi. So, and outside the temple there are all these horns of animals, and the Paharis believe that Hidimba Devi protects them from all evil. Indeed. In, there was a fire, but this temple Stood. built of wood was totally protected. So, in your research, Namita, have you come across any such stories or any other place where Hidimba is worshipped and looked yes, upon? Yes, indeed, in Kumau, in Satal, 
just a little way away, but it's a steep climb and I'm meaning to go there with my book when I can find somebody who will carry me up. <laughs> but um, there is a temple to Hidimbi there. It is called Hidimba Van Durga. So she is known as the Van Durga, the, the mountain, uh, the forest Durga. And it has the same uh, sort of meanings as the great temple to Hidimbi in Manali. So it is in our mountains in Himachal and Kumao. Because we always are more inclusive. And I've said before, the reason why these mountain people are so much more inclusive in their attitude to the Rakshashas, to the Churels, to the Gauls and the ghosts is because Shivji was from there. And Shivji was famous for his Shivji ki Bharat, which was full of such uh, creatures. Last question. A lot of my questions have already been answered, but you know, when it comes to writing about such history and great epics, you have to be factually correct as well. So how much research did you actually put into it? And this story, how much do you think it's relevant in today's time? I think the story is extremely relevant. I think if I had tried to be historically correct, it may not have been that relevant. It is a novel. It is a work of the imagination. Because I worked on the Puffin Mahabharat, which I read a lot, and again, I've read for this many versions. I read a wonderful book by M.T. Vasudevan Nair on Bhim, uh, which was, there, there are so many books on Bhim. Uh, and on Hidimba, there's a beautiful book by uh, Narendra Kohli. But the, where I really got material was also Bibek de Broglie's uh, Mahabharata. But I just shut my eyes and wrote it, what came to me in my imagination. So I don't claim to be historically accurate. It's a work of the imagination. So let me ask one last question, yeah, actually, please. while I'm at... I might ask you a question uh, then. Namita, what a range, like, all the way from Paro, uh, was the book banned? Was it burned? No, no. No, none. Okay. Sorry. But it was controversial yes. for its time. All the way from Paro to something like Lost in Time. Such a range, travel, uh, writing for kids, writing for adults. How do you sort of manage to uh, navigate all of these different strains and at the same time uh, program this, not just this festival, but all the four uh, JLFs across the world? Where do you find the time in your head uh, and as well as in your heart and soul to be able to do it? Well, for my heart and soul, being a part of the Jaipur Literature Festival, gives me so much. I meet writers, I read books, it gives everything I could ever want in terms of creative inspiration. In terms of time, this book, I had no time to write it because I was doing lots of other things. Himali pushed me to write it, Himali Sodi, and she pushed me and I did it. I used to write 200 words a day, which is just the very littlest you can write. And the only time I got two days out of town in the Corbett National Park are the best parts, which are the secrets of the forest. So when you, when you got to write, you got to write. There's no other way around it. The other question is that perhaps I could have done better as a writer had I stuck to one genre. I've done a little bit of everything. And uh, so it's very difficult to understand and how to position me. But for me, each story, is an adventure and a quest. And I think as a festival director, I'm saying, is it time for us to close? Are we running out of time, no. friends? And the last question to John, I don't know whether you all can see it, his concept of time is actually a snake swallowing its tail. So tell us a little bit about that. So this was another interesting piece in the book, which um, we actually decided with uh, the great team at Penguin. I'm not sure if they're here, but Showing somewhere easier. at the back. Yeah. Yes. So um, we decided to have this sort of arborous figure where, which was actually supposed to sort of go around the entire page. The coil of time. The coil of time. And it sort of ended up being more of something that I wanted to keep very symmetrical and not just have a, you know, a, a border around a page. but to keep it such that it's in a constant loop and we're all sort of, you know, on this sort of loop going back and forth through the story. So that was kind of like a, almost like a poetic justice to have something like a visual representation of this moving through time as it were throughout the book. So thank you both for this fascinating journey in Lost in Time. For those of you, uh, Ghatoch Coach and the Game of Illusions, it's truly a spectacular book to be given.
as gifts to be read and be, to be taken back. So please do so. The books are available there. Damita and Ujjan are happy to sign it. And perhaps the pages, once they sign, you'll be able to sell at some point of time for a very a lot of money. Because thank you all very thank much. You, Sanjoy, thank you, Sanjoy, for finding the time from everything else thank that you're you. doing. And uh, yeah, it's really a JLF baby, this book. This one. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen.